In module 2.1, we're gonna be talking about conceptual modeling or conceptual data modeling framework. What is an entity relationship or ER model and who uses ER models and what we use them for. So when we left off last time, this was one of the last things we did in class. We uh, created this pretty simple ER model for uh, Dave's dog wash. And we say we have these relationships where a customer owns a dog, an employee grooms a dog, employees work at a location, and dogs are dropped off at a location, right? So this is a very high-level view of the vignette that we talked about last week in class. And then we uh, extended it a little bit further and said, well, all of these entities have attributes and there are other structural constraints around participation and and uh, cardinality and all of these other more detailed, more nuanced things that describe the story. So this is what we're going to be learning about uh, tonight in class. So for example, for each one of our attributes, we have a little line with a dot. And if that dot is filled in, that means that that attribute or having a value for that attribute is mandatory. So we have to know the pet's name, the pet's weight, the pet's breed. But if the dot is not filled in, that indicates that the attribute is optional, right? So for the customer, we have to have their address, first name, last name, and phone number. But if they don't want to give us their email address, that's fine. It's optional. These uh, ones and M's and N's that are on either side of our relationship diamond represent the cardinality. And we're going to talk more about what these words mean uh, throughout the rest of class. So that's cardinality. These dashes and circles that are nearer to the entities uh, indicate whether participation in the relationship is required or optional uh, for either entity. If we have a dot that is circled, that means we can have multiple values for that attribute. Uh, if the dot is, has dotted lines, it means that is a derived or calculated attribute, okay? Uh, so instead of storing it, we, we calculate that based on some other attribute. And then our primary key, which is going to be our unique identifier for the, uh, for the entity, and there's actually a much more nuanced and detailed uh, definition for that, which we'll get into in a few lectures. But uh, for now, we can just say this is our unique identifier, and uh, we indicate that by underlining the name of the attribute. Okay, so real quick overview of what we're going to be talking about with our ER grammar. And specifically, the ER grammar that we're going to be talking about is the chin notation. And this is a very widely used uh, modeling grammar, chin notation and the crowfoot notation are the two uh, kind of big ones. Chin notation gets used a lot in an academic setting and in, in classes because it is a little bit more verbose and it's a little bit more uh, kind of specific about every little thing we're doing so it's a little bit easier for pointing out specific concepts so chin notation is primarily what we're going to be using in this class uh, but we will look at the crow's foot notation uh, just a little bit throughout the semester but whichever notation we're using whichever er modeling grammar we are using they all share these five properties that make them useful. They're expressive, they're simple, they're minimal, they have a unique interpretation, and they are formal, okay? So expressiveness means that they have enough, uh, enough symbols and enough different ways of expressing uh, these, these business rules that we're trying to capture that they can capture pretty much all of the uh, potential uh, business requirements and business applications that we would need to. Okay, so they have enough to be expressive for whatever we need, but they also don't have a whole lot of extra stuff, right? There is a level of simplicity around it such that there aren't, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of really weird archaic characters and symbols that are going to be difficult to explain. And the reason this is really valuable is because one of the primary uh, reasons for creating an ER model is to be able to take a business problem that's been explained to you and document it in this technical drawing and then explain that back to a business user who may not be technical, who may not have had this class and learned ER modeling and things like that. So it's simple enough to be explained to people that uh, you know don't have any technical training. 
Uh, minimality, kind of the same idea, meaning we don't have a lot of extra, extra stuff, right? It's just kind of what we need and nothing more. And kind of on the other side of that, there is a unique interpretation for everything we're doing. So our model is going to be unambiguous. So we can take this model and write SQL code that completely uh, captures everything in our data model and have a good solid technical implementation of the model. And the formality, you know, there are right and right and wrong ways to model something, right? We can't just kind of willy nilly do whatever we want because we do have to have the, uh, the technically correct product on the other side of it. So uh, the formality comes into play there. And when we create these models, they really serve two purposes, right? It's a kind of user friendly uh, graphical representation of what we're going to implement on the database that we can use to explain to our end users, right? To our uh, customer who came to us and asked for this or to our boss, right? So it's, uh, it's used to communicate that back down to the end user but then also to communicate to our technical people, to the DBA or to whoever is going to actually write the SQL code and implement this database. Uh, you know, it's a, a technically precise representation of the business rules we can use to, uh, to create our database, right? So it works in both directions. So to the users, it's what are the business rules? And to the techies, it's how are we going to implement these business rules in the database okay so the diagram contains our entities our attributes that's all these things kind of hanging off of our entity uh, rectangles here and the relationships between the entities or our diamonds and then there are semantic integrity constraints that reflect our business rules and that's what's captured in all of the other symbols right our ones and our m's that represent cardinality our participation, the different uh, constraints around the attributes, whether they're required, optional, multi-value, uh, derived, things like that. And if there's anything that we can't represent graphically, typically we just kind of write those out in long form or in bullet points in a document that would go along with this ER model. So I've mentioned a couple of times now business rules, but we haven't really talked about what a business rule is. And what a business rule is, is a statement of some specific condition or procedure that is relevant to what we are modeling. Okay, And business rules sometimes are explicitly stated, but more often than not, it's something that is implied by the users that we're talking to. And we have to infer what they actually mean, right? And there's a couple of problems that uh, that having to read between the lines and understand what people are trying to describe, uh, a couple of problems that come up. One, people often don't mean exactly what they say, right? People are not very good at uh, having very precise language. We speak in generalities a lot of times. And because of this, when we try to infer uh, infer technical details will often get them wrong, right? So this is going to be an iterative process of getting the business requirements, documenting them in an ER diagram, and then taking that back to the customer, the user, the manager, whoever we're working with, and explaining back to them how we understood the requirements that they, that they gave us, right? So for example, you know, at your company, there might be a, a business rule that says, you know, all employees have a title. Okay, well, that's, that's a perfectly fine business rule, but what do we really mean by all employees have a title? So do all employees have exactly one title? Or is it possible that an employee could have multiple titles, right? So like here at the university, you might be a professor of MIS, and also be the associate dean of students, right? So you've got two separate titles, right? At a lot of banks, you have a functional title and you have an official title. So when I worked for the bank, I was a senior systems engineer, but I was also a vice president of information technology, right? I have these two titles, and banks have hundreds of vice presidents. That's not a very fancy title, to be honest. 
Uh, so I had two titles at the bank. So whether you have one title or multiple titles, both perfectly valid you know, business rules to have, we can configure the database to do either one, but we just have to make sure that the user or whoever's asking for this database and the designer are on the same page. Otherwise, we're gonna have some, some conflict, right? We're talking about salary. You know, what's the limit on salary for this company? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's no limit, right? We're not gonna say that no one in this company can make more than $100,000 or $500,000 or a million dollars, right? But I don't know, maybe we do want to put some limit in there to catch people like making typos. And instead of uh, you know saying this person makes $150,000 a year, if they try to type in $15 million a year, then the database would throw an error message and say, no, we don't pay people $15 million a year. It would be nice, I'd like to work there. Or maybe to make sure we understand when we talk about salary, are we talking about an annual salary? Or are we talking about a monthly salary? Or an hourly salary or weekly salary? Like how are we storing this salary data in the database. Lots of right answers, we just have to make sure that we're all talking the same language and that's what our entity relationship diagrams are going to help us uh, do and explain to the business. So as we go through this iterative process of having business rules explained to us, documenting them in a technically precise format and then explaining them back to the users, we're gonna go through this iterative process and systematically we're gonna find errors and ambiguities that we're going to clarify and we may uh, ultimately wind up having additional business rules that we need to add in, but you know, ultimately we get to a, a good final product. So all of this kind of leads into another question and this is actually uh, kind of related to this idea of defining entities and attributes and relationships in the application and that being pushed back out to the database. But we can define business rules in the application or we can define them in the database or we could do both. And if you guys have any experience doing any programming in, in any language in Java or Python or C Sharp or whatever, you've probably gone through the exercise of doing some kind of a form validation or input validation. And you can uh, you know, do things like check if they, don't, if they didn't put in a phone number and if they didn't put it in in the right format, then the application is gonna throw an error message, right? So that's enforcing the business rule at the application layer. But then we can also enforce those constraints at the DBMS layer. And I'm suggesting that we need to define those constraints at least in the database. We can do both if we want, but at least in the database. Why in the database instead of the application? Why is it so important to define them in the database? So the wrong values are not in the database. Oh, I'm sorry, try one more time. So that incorrect value is not stored in the database? So incorrect values are not stored in the database. That's, that's a big part of it. I think we, can, we could probably ensure that at the application layer, but good to have you know, both. Um, I think because the database is like the central location of the data and applications feed off that central location. So it makes sense to make changes in the central location than the respective application. Yeah, in the, in the central location instead of in the individual application. So that makes a lot of sense in this three-tier uh, three, uh, three -tier schema architecture, right? We only have to define it in one place instead of reinventing the wheel in each application. And then let me, let me suggest even an extension to that, you know, building off of that idea. So we currently have, you know, these three applications that are interacting with the data, right? And one of our business rules... Uh, might be that like at the university, you cannot enroll in two classes that meet at the same time, right? That seems like a pretty reasonable business rule. So what if we only defined that business rule in the, at the application layer, right? In, in Access UH, you know, the website that you register for classes through, that's where that business rule is defined. 
But now someone goes and develops a new uh, like Android or iOS application that allows you to register for classes and they either don't know or didn't think about or don't care about this business rule that you can't enroll for two classes that meet at the same time. And so they don't implement that, that business requirement in their application. Well, now you've got one application that will allow you to do this thing, which violates the business rules and another application that won't. And so now we get into these issues of data integrity and inconsistent uh, behavior from applications and things like that. Now, on the other hand, if we had implemented that business rule at the DBMS layer, any application that's connecting to this database is going to have that business rule automatically enforced. The database is going to throw an error message if you try to enroll for two classes at the same time and kick that error back up to the application. So just gives us a little bit more control and a little bit more uh, you know, data integrity, which is always a good thing. All right, so that's module 2.1, kind of getting this idea of what ER models are, right? They capture our entities and our relationships and our attributes and all the, uh, all the constraints around our attributes. And then ER models are used both to discuss uh, our technical understanding of the business rules with the users, but then also used by our more technical people to implement that in the database.